This is Holding Court with Patrick McEnroe. You know, it's funny because I'm looking, you know, I, I always go over the stats a little bit, right, when I have a former player on so we know all about your, is it, I think it's 21 majors, right, in doubles? Is it 21? 21 in, 20, 21 in ladies doubles and then and one then in mixed. A, and my, one in mixed, right. And who is your partner, by the way, in the mix? Emilio Sanchez. But here's a little snippet that I pulled out of, of reminding myself of all your great numbers. Uh, you're a Hall of Famer, of course. Do you? Are you I, I don't know if you know this. Do you know that you actually won more? Because everybody knows you as one of the great doubles players. People forget that you are number three in the world in singles. You won. Not only did you win 21 titles in singles, you won more matches in singles than you did in doubles. Did you know that, Pam? Well, I mean that's, I a, knew that's I, according to that's according to Wikipedia. Yeah, I knew I won over six hundred in singles, and I know that's a lot. And yes, singles it is. draws are bigger, so it it doesn't really surprise me. But I think I'm pretty close. The thing that freaked me out was when Martina retired for the first time. It was like she she had won I don't know 167 titles in each singles and doubles, and that was something I couldn't believe. <laughs> well, just for the record, I think it's 600. And 26 in singles and like 621 in doubles. Okay. So, uh, as I said, I bring it up because uh, I want you to know and our fans to know that I do my homework. Okay. And that you were an unbelievable singles player as well. But uh, as I've told you before, in when we were communicating back and forth, I'm very excited about season four because there's three main topics for the podcast season. Of course, tennis. Um, what's going on currently in the world of tennis. So we could just talk about that in our sleep. Number two is this intersection of sports and politics, which you and I could also talk about with your background and history. But number three is mental health and mental well-being. And, of course, mental health and tennis go hand in hand. So I feel like we can cover those two. And that's really why I wanted you to come on at this particular time. We can talk about women's tennis and, and, and the situation that's in there now. But you know, you released your article last year. You said it was because you were turning 60. You talked about the relationship that you had with your coach at the time when you were a teenager, and it was important for you to put it out there publicly now at this stage in your life, for you personally, but also for the state of women's tennis in general. So if you could expand on that um, as we lead into this, I would be very appreciative. You know, it's a really difficult thing to uh, go public with. It took me a long time. I kind of just pushed it down. Um, but basically, you know, from 17 until about 22 and a half, um, I had a relationship with my primary coach that crossed over all uh, boundaries. Uh, it became um, what you would classify today in, in today's world as uh, sexual abuse, um, abuse of power because... You know, if you're a student of a teacher or a coach or, you know, any position of trust and power, you really have to keep the boundaries firm. We know a lot more now than, say, back in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, the language is different. Um, but what I've observed in my decades on the tour is that there's still too many uh, women players um, that either haven't quite figured out how to keep the boundaries or... The people on their teams are very good at, um, you know, the grooming and the manipulating, and then the relationship ends up uh, blurred lines, unhealthy, not good for really the coaching profession or any profession, say physio or anything, and it certainly isn't good for uh, a female tennis player. That's not to say if you're old enough, mature enough, and you've known, you know, you, and you meet a coach, you know, in the workplace these things happen, but... We need better safeguarding. We need to work together on this. And I believe that safeguarding and keeping the workplace safe needs to be on the same pedestal as anti-doping and anti-corruption. And that's really my mission right now. You know, it's interesting the way you phrase that because it, what came to my mind was something you, you then addressed um, later in your comments, which was, you know, there could be a situation, right, where there's a, there's a female tennis player that, you know, they're in their mid, late 20s or they're 30 and, they have a coach who could even be similar age or a little bit older and, or, or a lot older. And, and maybe that's, a, you know, because there are some female tennis players that actually married their, you know, what was their coach or their trainer. 
But it's, it's as, as you said, finding that line of when it's appropriate, when it's not appropriate. If you look at team sports, obviously, if there's a coach of the women's basketball team or the soccer team, it would be completely inappropriate, right, no matter what. But in tennis, because it's such an individual sport, it's sometimes harder to find that line, isn't it? And, I mean, I think if you're talking about a teenager, that's pretty obvious, right? But, it, it, you know, it's particularly women's tennis now, they're like the men's game. They're playing longer. They're out there longer. They're more, you know, they're real adults at this stage. So how do you kind of navigate trying to find that balance and educating the players appropriately? Well, I think education's right at the core of this whole thing. I think, you know, the earlier, and the, and the education has to start well before a player hits the WTA tour. It really has to start at the ITF junior level. Um, it has to start in, in cultures all over the world. Um, but honestly, I, I, I actually believe that eventually I'd like the workplace to have certain protocols, you know, like... In certain corporate worlds, um, if uh, if you start to uh, date somebody within the same company, you can't report to them. They can't be in the same division. Sometimes they then move people out of different divisions. So there are ways to keep, um, you know, workplaces safe and healthy. How you do it on the tennis tour is something that some new people that have been brought on. There's a new director of safeguarding, uh, Lindsay Brandon. She's just a couple of months in. She comes from a strong safeguarding background. So there's a few experts. There's a new person at the uh, at the TIAI um, that's really uh, looking at, that's looked at through the years, the anti-doping and the anti-corruption, but now they're also looking at safeguarding. So I'm trying to be a connector and try and just get the dialogues moving and don't have all the answers yet. It's, it's, it is almost a year since I came out with my story, and I thought there'd be more progress, more people coming forward. But this is a slow slog and i have patience and um i i think we're going to make progress in the coming years i like to think of myself as someone that's done a lot in the different areas of tennis and then i look at you and in many ways you're someone i've always looked up to because you have done that from the start you know whether it's on the wta tour you were the first president of the usta foundation i came in after you served there so you've You've, you've navigated uh, so many different paths. And now uh, it's so awesome for me to see you get into coaching because I know that's something that you've talked about for a long time. There aren't enough female coaches. And, you know, we, we all know the reasons why. Um, uh, but we also know that the opportunities haven't always been there for whatever reason. And uh, how has it been for you? Because obviously your player, Donna Vekic, who you've been working with since – uh, late last year and now beginning of 2023 is, has had great results. But what, what's it been like for you um, doing one of the only things in the sport that you never really did, which is become a coach on the tour? Patrick, I'm so surprised. Four and a half months after going down to San Diego, I drove down from my home in L.A. when there was a San Diego Open, a 500 WTA event. I wasn't working as a broadcaster. My kids kind of had nothing much going on. So I I just went down. I wanted to actually talk to some of the players on the player council about safeguarding, actually. That's why I drove down. Donna Vekic is on the player council. Pagula was down there. Uh, Grabowski, Dorowski was down there. So I, I, I kind of went down there with that as my main agenda. I also went down as a fan of women's tennis. I wanted to see some matches in person where I wasn't working. And so I contacted Donna. We met after her. she won her qualifying match. She was ranked about 75 in the world. And, of course, like you and I, whenever we watch a tennis match, you kind of start to analyze. You start to look at it. You look at the tactics, and you look, you just look at things, right? So I actually, my first conversation before we got to safeguarding or anything, I said, you know, we talked about her match a little bit. I said, are you open to some input? She said, yes. And there you have it. That's how it all wow. started. That's how it and started, did, right. Yeah, and then she got the finals of San Diego. She wanted me to watch as many of her matches there, and I ended up, flipping my week around. I didn't really have a lot going on, and I ended up watching her play, and she beat Sakari, Pliskova, Sabalenka, and Daniel Collins to play Sviantec in the finals. And at a set of piece, I'm like, wow, this is some rookie accidental debut. And then she's been rolling ever since. And it's more about clarity of thought and some things that I learned from when I played, some things you learn as a broadcaster that are really important. And she's been a great listener, and I've been, it's been an unbelievable first experience for me see your ranking go back from in such a short period of time from 75 to now 27 in the live rankings. 
So can't ask for more. Holding Court is powered by Mudhouse Media.